straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Local media takes center stage in the Chandler Halderson trial. And tonight we're left to wonder what happened to Bart and Krista Halderson. What the defendant told reporters days before his parents' remains were found. And where is Harmony Montgomery? All efforts are focused on that Harmony is alive and we are going to do everything we can to find her. The seven-year-old's father is arrested two years after she was last seen. Plus... Should an LAPD officer face charges? The latest on the deadly shooting inside a Hollywood clothing store. And later, could a juror's admission lead to a new trial for Ghislaine Maxwell? What a juror revealed in a new interview. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. We're learning more about how defendant Chandler Halderson acted in the days after his parents were reported missing. All this just six months before he stands trial for murdering and dismembering them both. The 23-year-old is charged in the deaths of Bart and Krista Halderson. Prosecutors say he murdered them, cut up their bodies with knives and saws, and attempted to burn their remains in the family fireplace. After that, he scattered other parts of their bodies across southern Wisconsin. Before the remains were discovered, Halderson reported his parents missing to police and told a similar story to Madison, Wisconsin TV stations. On Wednesdays, those news reports took center stage in the courtroom. The search continues for this couple, Krista and Bart Halderson. They live near DeForest. They were reported missing yesterday. NBC 15's Elise Romas joins us live from the Dane County Sheriff's Office Northeast Precinct. Elise, you spoke with their son and people in the Halderson's neighborhood. Yeah, John, the Helderson's son says that he helped his parents pack up the night before their trip to their cabin in Langlade County. He hasn't seen them since. I was told they'd be home Monday or Tuesday, and Tuesday afternoon I got a little worried. Helderson told the same story to family friends, adding that his parents went to their cabin for the 4th of July weekend. On Wednesday, Krista Halderson's best friend told jurors she searched the Halderson family cabin and called the defendant from that property. He's like, did you find anything? And I said, like, what? And I was shocked that he said any bullet shells or any blood or anything. And I went, what? And he's like, did you find anything? And I'm like, no, no one's been here. And he's like, okay, what do you think I should do? I'm like, you need to report them as missing. Obviously, they didn't make it here. I don't know how they could go to a parade if they didn't make it here. But whatever. Maybe they stayed somewhere else. I didn't know. Other family friends took the stand, saying they visited Halderson at his Windsor, Wisconsin home after hearing his parents were missing. The detectives leave. I wanted to go with them but why um just a weird vibe and this is just not somewhere i just didn't feel very safe like i i felt um i don't know how to explain it but this is it's like i'm sitting in the middle of what now seems to be a crime scene with somebody who is acting differently than i'm used to and it it just doesn't feel like a good idea in the moment he told me you know they're probably just at a casino what did um, you think of that comment? There's no way. There's just no way that they are, like, just the sweetest loving people you will ever meet. And there is no way that, you know, they would have ever put anyone that they love or care about in a situation where they're worried about where they are. Joining us today is legal analyst Kirk Nurmi and Terry Austin. Kirk, hindsight is 2020, but all of these witnesses seem to be pointing, at the very least, to red flags about Hollison and his parents. But how do red flags turn into a conviction for the prosecution? Yeah, Brian, if there's such a thing as an ordinary murder, this certainly isn't one of them, right? Because the defendant in this case is accused of not only killing his parents, dismembering the body, burning body parts, scattering them across the state. That makes him a particular kind of gruesome. That makes him a particular kind of monster, right? So. For the story to be complete, the state in this case has to prove that not just the murder, but his post 
murder actions were consistent with the story, with this monstrous behavior. So I think all these friends and family members, and we see his actions post, uh, post murder kind of help illustrate that, the eerie feelings they got, that sort of thing, all help paint the picture of this defendant as a monster. Yeah, it definitely sets that kind of mood as it continues. Terry, in the defense's opening, they said, look for what's missing, look for alternatives. Are you seeing anything missing or any alternatives here? Brian, I'll tell you what's missing. The entire defense is missing. When I listened to that opening, it was the most generic opening I've ever seen. They didn't mention any facts. They didn't mention any evidence. And in fact, that's because the evidence against the defendant is overwhelming. All the defense talked about in the opening was what his constitutional rights might be, what the burden of proof is as far as the prosecution is concerned. They did not assert any alternate theory at all whatsoever. In fact, what they told the jury is, when this case is over, you're going to have no answers. I've never heard an opening where they tell the jury, you're not going to know what happened. The worst defense opening I've ever heard. Yeah, it's what many defense attorneys call a non-opening opening. Hopefully in the summation, they put together uh, some facts that point to some reasonable doubt if they expect or hope for a not guilty verdict in this case. Also in Wisconsin, a man said to be tried in the death of a prominent Milwaukee attorney is denied bail just days after his jury trial was postponed due to COVID concerns. Theodore Edgecombe is accused of killing immigration attorney Jason Clearman last year in Milwaukee in what police are calling a road rage incident. Edgecombe's defense attorneys claim he acted in self-defense. They argue Clearman's car, which his wife was driving at the time, tried to run Edgecombe off the road while he was on his bike. The criminal complaint says the two got into a fight and Edgecombe allegedly punched Clearman through the open passenger side window. Then Clearman later got out of the car and Edgecombe shot him. Edgecombe claims Clearman had a knife. The prosecution says he fled the state. He was arrested six months later in Kentucky. Edgecombe appeared in a virtual bond hearing on Wednesday where defense attorneys argued it would be safer for him to be released. Things got heated when Judge David Borowski said to the attorneys that this hearing was not the time to litigate the case. Every expert in America would agree that the safest place for Mr. Edgecombe to be would be home to ensure that he is healthy and that he will be able to stand trial come January 18th. Number two, um, you know, there's been other material differences as it um, as the evidence has come about in this case. Number one, the video. Um, there's complete video evidence which will tend to show, at least arguably, that Mr. Edgecombe acted reasonably um, and that any force that was used was completely in self-defense. Also looking at the strength of the state's case, um, I mean, we've attached to the motion that was filed, which is a short motion, but also pictures of the knife that was located on Mr. Clearman's person. Um, he was armed with an eight and a half inch knife with a serrated blade. So we have attached that. I did have a chance to inspect. Well, hang on, hang on, Mr. Ahmad. Just like I said to Ms. Lamar, I don't want to try the case. The case is set for trial in two weeks. We're not trying it today. And I don't want to try it specifically with the media here to listen so that it can go and be sensationalized. What evidence comes in during the trial, I will rule on at the appropriate time. Don't litigate this any further in front of the media when the only issue here today is bail. The trial is scheduled to begin on January 18th. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, calls for a California police officer to resign or be charged over the shooting of a 14-year-old in a Burlington coat factory. But first, movement in New Hampshire after a girl who hasn't been seen in two years was recently reported missing. We bring you the latest developments as an arrest is made in the case. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Welcome back. The father of a seven-year-old girl who's been missing for more than two years now faces charges and appears in court in New Hampshire. Law and Crime's Angela Levy is here with the details. 
Brian, it's really unbelievable, but the police chief in Manchester, New Hampshire, says no one has seen Harmony Montgomery since October of 2019. Now her father, Adam Montgomery, is charged with second-degree assault, interfering with custody, and endangering the welfare of a child. Now, Adam Montgomery is accused of hitting Harmony in the eye in 2019 and giving her a black eye. Court documents state Adam Montgomery's brother told police he was abusive toward his daughter by spanking her hard, making her stand in the corner for hours and forcing her to clean a toilet with her own toothbrush. The brother also told police that Adam Montgomery admitted to bashing Harmony around the house. Now, Harmony's mother reported her missing last month, saying she had tried to find her but lost custody of her in 2018 to Adam Montgomery because she had a substance abuse problem. Manchester's police chief pleaded with anyone with information about Harmony's whereabouts to come forward. I'm appealing to everyone. <clears throat> Help us find this little girl. Someone knows something, do what is right, and call in. I cannot emphasize that enough. Somebody out there knows something. It's time for people to do the right thing. I cannot say it enough. I cannot emphasize it enough. Someone needs to call in, do the right thing, and provide us information on where Harmony may be. Now, Adam Montgomery's uh, bail, he actually waived his arraignment, and he's being held without bail at this time. There was an agreement made between his attorney and the attorney general's office on that bail and with the court. And it appears that Adam Montgomery, uh, according to people who knew him, also had substance abuse problems. There is a $33,000 reward for anyone who can provide information to Harmony uh, about Harmony's whereabouts and what happened to her. And there is also a tip line. You can call or text 603-203-6060. Brian. Thank you, Angie. And of course, if you have any information about Harmony, make sure to follow up on that number. Let's bring back legal analyst Kirk Nurmi and Terry Austin to discuss the latest in a search for Harmony. Terry, how does a five-year-old not seen for two years be reported by child services only a week ago make any sense? Brian, nothing in this case makes sense to me. First of all, we know the mother lost custody in 2018, like Anjanette said, because of substance abuse. And she last saw the child in 2019. And we know that the father had custody and that he beat the child. And we know that the father's uncle reported all this. We know that the brother reported some of the abuse as well. So we also know that the child had been in child services in two different states, Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So all of these people had some contact with this child, and yet she hadn't been seen for two years. It just doesn't make sense. Every single person in this case dropped the ball and it is a complete failure. Now, Kirk, based on the charges, what can we assume the prosecution believes, and why no charges more serious than the assault? Well, I think we can believe that the prosecution believes exactly what they've put out in the indictment, that they have evidence of abuse, neglect, all those sort of things. Now, you ask, you know, why no, no further charges? I think he's been arrested on these charges and hope to put pressure on him so that maybe he will be more forthcoming or somehow cracked as it relates to the other charges. But for now, why none? Because, one, we don't have proof of death, right? Like Terry just said, nothing in this case makes sense. We don't have proof of death. Yeah, you know, there's cases that can go forward without a body. There have been murder cases that do go forward in that regard. But I think before they charge, before they feel like they have a strong case, the authorities in this case want to go back over those two missing years and really nail it down hard unless they can get him to confess in a custodial situation. Makes sense. Now, and Jeanette, Manchester police had contact with Harmony back in 2019, right? That's right. They went to a, a home where she was uh, living at the time, and we are only being told at this time by the police chief that it was a call for service and that police had contact with Harmony, but they're really not releasing any other information uh, about that call. And when the police chief was asked whether or not there was some type of law enforcement breakdown or failure, he said that would be dealt with when the time is appropriate. So you have to believe that something went terribly wrong here. Let's hope bringing light to this case gets more answers, both for the family and the police. Thank you all.
Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, pro protesters call for the arrest of a Los Angeles police officer after the shooting death of a 14-year-old girl. Plus, could Ghislaine Maxwell's conviction be overturned? Why Jeffrey Epstein's former girlfriend could have a chance at a new trial. Welcome back. Protesters are calling for a Los Angeles police officer to be fired or arrested after the fatal shooting of a 14-year-old girl two weeks ago. Two days before Christmas, Officer William Jones Jr. responded to 911 calls of a man assaulting women at a Burlington Coat Factory in North Hollywood. Several of those callers told dispatchers they suspected the man had a gun. Police say Daniel Elena Lopez did not have a firearm at the scene, but had assaulted several women with a metal bike lock. Body camera video shows the moment officers arrived and when they fatally shot Lopez. 14-year-old Valentina Orlando Peralta was in the store's fitting room with her mother when Jones fired his weapon. That fitting room was right behind the suspect. Peralta was shot and died as a result of her injuries. Jones is on paid leave while the incident is being investigated. Civil rights attorney Ben Crump, who has recently been in the spotlight for representing the families of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, is representing the Peralta family. Back with us is legal analyst Kirk Nurmi and co-host Terry Austin to discuss the latest in this tragic loss out of L.A. Terry, as demonstrators call for action, what potential civil and criminal charges could Officer William Jones Jr. face? Well, in California, on the criminal side, he could really face involuntary manslaughter. And all they would have to show there is that, you know, he killed another resulting in death and it was without malice, without intent, and it involved a high risk of death. And I think an argument can be made that shooting in a crowded store does involve high risk of death. There's a chance that you could definitely hit someone else. And on the civil side, we already saw that Ben Crump is already working with the family. There could be a lawsuit for a wrongful death action to recover compensation by the family for this loss. So definitely facing some charges, both civil and criminal. Absolutely. Now, Kirk, a third angle is that the result of the tragedy could see changes in police procedures. Do you think things could or should change in L.A. policing after this? Well, definitely, you know, and Terry hit on the key point, right? Shooting in an open store. What kind of risk does that cause? Because while the police came in in a high-risk situation, they didn't, you know, there were some callers that said there was a gun. There were some that didn't. So while it was a high-risk situation, there was no confirmation of a weapon, and it turns out there wasn't one. So I think things like this, before one starts shooting in a crowded store, that have to be considered because of this tragedy. Certainly, this young victim was not a target of this man, but certainly his actions could be considered reckless in the situation, given that he is in a crowded department store. Of course, changes are going to depend on what all the body cameras and all the store footage show, but ultimately that risk of shooting bullets into a crowded store is something I think LAPD is going to have to take a long, hard look at. Yeah, we're interested to see the results of this case. We'll make sure to keep updates as they continue. The recently convicted British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell could be entitled to a new trial. When we come back, how a juror's pass could lead to a motion for mistrial. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily. Ghislaine Maxwell's defense team could ask for a new trial after news that a juror may not have disclosed childhood sexual abuse to the court. The juror, known by his first and middle name only, Scotty David, told Reuters he opened up about his past abuse only during deliberations, as fellow jurors questioned the credibility of some witnesses. That's when Scotty David told them he could also only remember some of the sexual abuse from his childhood. He also said he understood why some witnesses didn't come forward until later in life, because he told them that he waited years to admit the abuse to anyone. According to the court records, juror questionnaires asked whether potential jurors had a history of sexual abuse. Scotty David also told Reuters that he flew through the questionnaire and doesn't remember being asked that question. Prior to this news, Maxwell's team already indicated it would be seeking an appeal to the guilty conviction. On Wednesday, prosecutors informed Judge Allison Nathan about the allegations urging for an inquiry. 
Kirk, does a juror swaying a jury this way seem like a legitimate appellate issue or a fishing expedition by the defense? I think it's a legitimate issue, Brian, because, you know, if we have a juror that misrepresented himself on the questionnaire and then, you know, was maybe less than forthcoming during voir dire, I mean, we have voir dire for a reason, right, to ensure that everybody gets a fair trial. And if he wasn't forthcoming, then goes back to the jury deliberation room and kind of gives evidence, gives his explanation, gives an, an analogy to the juries in his own, own experience, that's exactly the kind of thing that a defendant under the Sixth Amendment is titled to ferret out during voir dire. So I think we will see this a motion for a new trial, possibly a inquiry into this, and ultimately it will probably be a part of any appeal that takes place in this case if it's denied. Yeah, and you better believe that Aguilene Maxwell's defense attorneys knew about this. They would have struck him off the bat. Terry, what's the process of getting to the truth of how the jury came to its decision? Will we have a hearing or some sort of questioning of this juror? Well, the first thing the judge is going to do is schedule an evidentiary hearing because they're going to want to know what the juror was questioned about and what were his answers and actually ask the juror, what was this experience that you had? And they're going to review the questionnaire, the judge is going to ask questions, the attorneys are going to ask questions. And the issue is, was he answering truthfully? And what Kirk said is 100% correct. You don't want a juror going back into deliberations talking about their experience. Yes, use common sense, but he's not an expert, so he should not go back there talking about that. So there's two issues here. Was he truthful and was he affecting these deliberations? And so, I mean, at the end of the day, he actually could be held in contempt. We could have a mistrial, and this could be started all over again. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's been interesting to see how this plays out as you get more information. Kurt, thank you very much for your debut here. And Terry, always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.